Okay, good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody make sure they switch off electronic devices or indeed switch them to silent mode so it doesn't interrupt the meeting? Um, agenda item one invites us to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Item two is where we'll take oral evidence on the Auditor General's report entitled Managing New Financial Powers, an update. I welcome to the committee Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Mark Taylor, Assistant Director, and Gordon Smale, Senior Manager, both from Audit Scotland. Um, I invite the Auditor General to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. The Scottish Parliament's financial powers are changing substantially. The Scotland Acts of 2012 and 2016 devolve new responsibilities for taxes, social security and borrowing. Implementing these new financial powers is a huge and complex programme of work. Today's report examines how the Scottish Government, Revenue Scotland and the Scottish Fiscal Commission are implementing or preparing to introduce these new powers. It also looks at how the Scottish Government is developing its public financial management arrangements in this context. My report assesses progress to February this year, since I last reported on the area in December 2015. The Scottish Government has made some good progress by getting the foundations in place for managing the new powers. It's updated its structures for overseeing them, has good programme management processes in place, and is establishing arrangements to share data with the relevant bodies. I'm also pleased to report that the transition of the Scottish Fiscal Commission to a statutory body is being managed effectively and Revenue Scotland is making good progress in preparing for further devolved taxes. The scale of the change needed to implement and manage the new financial powers is significant. There will be substantial changes in the type and volume of work the Scottish Government does, which will have major staffing implications. The Government is currently identifying the staff and skills that it needs, but recruiting enough people with the required skills may well be difficult. At the end of 2015-16, million £18.5 million have been spent on programmes to implement the new financial powers, and set-up costs will increase significantly over the next four years as the Government takes on its new Social Security responsibilities. The Government needs to build a clearer picture of the potential future costs and plan how it will fund them within its budget. Establishing the new Social Security arrangements is an exceptionally complex task and will require detailed plans. The Government's programme to deliver these arrangements is in its early stages, but once its approach is more established, it should share its proposals publicly. This will help support scrutiny and provide the public with more information in this key area. Overall, the powers in the Scotland Act 2016 are moving the public finances into new territory. Once fully implemented, half of what is spent in Scotland will be raised in Scotland, and the budget will be subject to greater uncertainty and volatility than ever before. In this changing environment, a more strategic approach to public financial management and reporting is needed. This includes a medium-term financial strategy based on clear policies and principles. The Scottish Government is developing its approach to financial management and it now needs to finalise and publish its principles for using the borrowing and reserve powers. It's also taking steps to provide a more comprehensive picture of the public finances. It's important that the Parliament and public do have the information they will need to understand and scrutinise the Government's financial decisions. Convener, as always, we're happy to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Um, do you have any comments on the Scottish Government's response? Um, I don't think we have any specific comments at this stage, Convener. Thank you. OK, that's helpful. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, Auditor General, just to clarify one thing in my mind, we talk about uh, new tax raising powers. Um, the tax raising element of it is, of course, various taxes like the, the land tax and all the rest of it. And these are raised in Scotland and we handle that here. There are other larger taxes like the allocation of VAT and the income tax is actually collected centrally and then allocated back to Scotland uh, on a notional basis according to what they believe that our share is. Is that, is that a correct interpretation? That's right. The devolved taxes, the existing landfill tax and uh, Scottish building land, land and transactions tax um, are currently set and raised in Scotland. The new air passenger duty and the aggregates levy will be set and raised in Scotland, but the income tax and the assigned VAT will be set in Scotland. Sorry, income tax will be set in Scotland, raised by HMRC, and VAT will be an assignment of a share of the VAT that's raised UK-wide. Okay, I think it's important to keep that distinction between that which we raise and that which we're 
allocated. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm a bit concerned about is actually the cost of setting this up. Um, there's an allocation of 200 million from the UK government, but you say on uh, page 11, paragraph 14 uh, of your report, that it's uh, it, the belief is that this is going to cost more. Now, do we have any idea where the pressure points are that are going to result in more? How was the 200 million actually, the figure actually reached? Was it just taken out of the air as being something reasonable or was it based on some calculation? The 200 million is the figure that which is contained in the fiscal framework agreement that was reached last spring between the UK and the Scottish Government. And I think it's fair to say um, that it was simply an agreement between the two governments of what they thought was reasonable. Um, I'll ask uh, Gordon, if I may, to give you a bit more information about where the Scottish Government is on its planning for the future costs of implementation. It's right to highlight this is a key element of the of the new setup and, and what it's costing and understanding the costs of what it it was taking to implement the new powers. Um, the short answer is there's not a lot of information available and this is one of the key points we have in the report. We've got a pretty good uh, fix in the spending to date and the amounts that are included in uh, last year's and this year's budget. But in terms of details beyond that, we don't have that, we don't have that available. The Scottish Government's identified an amount, as I say, it's included in the 17-18 budget. But at the time the budget was produced, there's no underpinning figures to that. We don't know the detailed breakdown. And one, I'd say one of the key elements of this report is to point out the importance of being cost aware, to identify and to monitor the costs that are being spent. But what we're seeing is at an individual project and programme level, there is information available, but there's less aggregation. And so, and so an ability to oversee, if you like, at the highest level what the total spend is. It's one of the recommendations in the report. So the £200 million was set. There was actually nothing behind that. It was just a, a figure that they decided was reasonable? or There must have been a basis. As the Auditor General says, I think it came out of the negotiations as part of the fiscal framework, and I, I don't have any further information as to the, the basis of that. Certainly, the Scottish Government at the time was saying that this will not be sufficient, and as we say in the report, um, uh, that, that's what we were told by government as well. Where are the main pinch points going to be on this? I mean, I see on page 14, for example, paragraph 23, you talk about additional budget being allocated to develop size and skills of the finance team, one, one relatively probably small area. But where is, where, where is the money going to be spent? Where, where are we going to see that budget overrun? Well, in terms of where the, where the main area of spend will be, what we've seen to date is... Um, you know, a build up over the last couple of years as, as the devolved taxes have come into play and as some of the other elements have come into play but the significant areas around the social security arrangements as these start to come in and the bulk of the money that's been set aside in the current year's budget is for social security implementation and the key areas there as you would expect are things like developing IT systems to support the new arrangements and staffing, new staff coming in to, uh, to, to, to manage the programmes and then to help uh, formulate policy and, in fact, overall delivery of the of the new arrangements. So the social security side at the moment is, is looming rather large. Is that going to be completely within the Scottish government in terms those elements in terms of uh, systems and management and so on, or are we still going? Is 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 it sort of delegated down from a, a central pot? I hope I made that clear. Yeah, and I understand where you're coming from, and Mark may be able to add a bit more detail about social security uh, arrangements themselves. But in terms of, uh, uh, yes, th this, this, is the, this is an area that's, uh, as we point out here, we are saying in the report that it's right the Scottish Government is taking its time to uh, understand what it's wishing to achieve through this. It has started to uh, give indications of, of what its proposed models and the options for that might be. But in terms of the detail of what that's going to look like, it's, it's fairly light on the ground at the moment. Uh, we're seeing in the report that's a fair position to be in because it's a big, complicated job, probably one of the biggest jobs the Scottish Government will have to do. But in terms of uh, getting the costs, um, the more that uh, the Government understands what it wishes to achieve, uh, the more of better information. And we're, what we're seeing here in the report and what we're recommending is that in all areas, including Social Security, there's a much clearer idea of what costs are going to be. It's a difficult area. This is all new to, to everybody, if you like. But what we're saying is that there's a real need to uh, have a close look at what you think the costs might be. So at least there's a starting off point, a conversation about the, where the costs and the spending will be, and then a basis to then go back and to monitor that. And that's one of the areas of the recommendations as well. Given 
given the fact that the government has already said there's going to be, it's going to overrun the 200 million, it must have a fair idea where those overruns are going to be, because they, they must have done at least you know, something on the back of an envelope or something to say we're going to be going over in these areas. So there must be some, somebody somewhere must have a, a grip of that. It's difficult for us to say on the basis of the evidence that's available to us. We know the amounts that are included in the budget. Uh, as I said, for 1718, for it's set out in the report. What we don't have is the breakdown of the detail of that. Um, I, I would assume that there's been some uh, consideration, there will have been some consideration as the government's put its budget together for 1718. But in terms of the information that's available to us and indeed the public, and it's an important element of this, I think, is the transparency around what the costs might be so that people can understand the very questions that you're asking of us this morning. You've mentioned already about the, the question of the aggregated costs. Is there anybody in the Scottish Government, do you think, that's actually got a grip of these aggregated costs? You would think so, if they've already worked out they're going to be in excess. There'll, be, there'll have been work and calculations to bring forward the amount that's included in the budget. I say we don't have details of that. What the report's calling for is, uh, it says at the start, there's an understanding of costs in individual prog programmes and projects. What we aren't seeing or what we see least, less evidence of is that aggregation and then oversight by the structures that are set out in the report in terms of the Fiscal Framework Implementation Board. Some oversight of the totality of the amounts to be spent so that questions, you know, there's, a, there's an understanding amongst everybody what it's going to be cost. But importantly, people can be held to account for the budgets that have been allocated. Is that a flaw in the process or is it simply inevitable at this stage we, should, we don't have that information? It's more to do with where we are in terms of the programmes. I think there is, a, um, there, is a, there are good examples of, uh, if you take f down into a bit more detail, there's good uh, information available, for example, about what Revenue Scotland has spent in implementing the two devolved taxes that are currently in play. Um, so there is something about the, uh, you know, the, the evolution and the understanding of these new arrangements. What we are saying here is at this stage, we're at a stage now where there needs to be a much better idea of what the costs are going to be, particularly in these uh, big, uh, uh, new, complicated areas such as social security that allows for a better, uh, more scope for better management of the costs as they're incurred, and as I say, oversight and holding to account when, if and when things happen to go uh, away from budget. Thank you. Liam, care. Okay. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, just a very quick matter arising on that. At uh, page 23, paragraph 55, you're talking about the Scottish rate of income tax. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify my own understanding because you uh, mentioned that HMRC has estimated the annual running costs of SRIT, uh, which I understand are reimbursed by the Scottish Government to HMRC, will increase to around 5 million if the Scottish rate of income tax is different. Could you just explain that for me, please? Yes, I'll, I'll <coughs> kick off and um, Mark may want to give you a bit more detail. Um, as we um, confirmed in response to Mr Beattie's question, although the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government have responsibility for setting all of the rates and bans for non-savings, non-dividend income tax, it will continue to be collected as part of the overall HMRC systems. Um, and HMRC have been of the very clear view since this was um, discussed that the costs of collection will be lower for them if the rates and bans are the same in Scotland as in the rest of the UK than if they're different. If they're different, they will need to make changes to their IT systems in order to collect the correct amount of uh, Scottish income tax from each of the relevant Scottish taxpayers. And there may also be additional costs in communication, compliance, the other elements of the cost of HMRC around it. The five million is, is their current estimate of that. Um, we show in the report how, how the estimates have changed since the Scotland Act 2012 came through, but I think that's the, the best uh, current estimate that's available. And is there a, a, a de minimis on that, so, such as uh, how different does the tax rate have to be, or is it just if there is any variation whatsoever, then the Finance Secretary will have to budget an extra four and a half million? Or I think that's a question you'd want to explore with the Scottish Government and HMRC when you take evidence from them. Um, my own assessment is that there probably is um, a level where there's a cost to any change, and the more significant the change, the greater the cost may be because of the compliance issues. Um, but obviously HMRC are going to be better placed to respond to that question. Thank you. Okay. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Convener. Um, Auditor-General, page 13, um, and looking at paragraph... 
17. Um, just at the bottom of the paragraph, or halfway through, it says the Scottish Government will need to develop more detailed cost estimates and refine them as policy discussions are made about how to implement and deliver certain powers. And then you give um, an example. Um, so just for, for clarity, when would you expect to see that level of detail? Uh, is there any kind of suggested timeline for that? Um, we set out in the report the timeline for the devolution of the new social security powers um, on Exhibit 6, page 26. And you'll see there that there, there is a sort of phased implementation um, running up to 2021 with some discretion for the Scottish Government on what it intends to do. So to an extent there's a trade-off between um, the extent of the changes it wishes to make and the time it will take to do that. But actually 2021 clearly isn't very far away from now, so we think having more clarity soon um, would be valuable, um, both in terms of the Parliament's availability ability to scrutinise it, but also the quality of the government's plans themselves. Yeah. God, do you want to add to that? No, I think that covers it, along with what I was saying to Mr Beattie earlier. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, on the, the next page, on page 14, and then looking at paragraphs 23 and 24, um, 23 starts with um, individual directorates and programmes are also identifying the staff and skills that they need to implement and manage the financial powers in the Scotland Act. Then in 24, it says the Scottish Government recognises the significant staffing implications of the new financial powers and the challenges it faces in recruiting staff with the skills it needs. So, first of all, do we have any estimate um, as to how many staff um, will, be, will be required? And in your view, how significant then are the challenges for that recruitment? Mark. Uh, thank you, Auditor General. I think, I think the short answer to the question is that there is no specific estimate of the additional staff that will be required. The government's approach in the outset is to think about the range of work that it's doing and where its priorities are and how it can allocate and reallocate staff to those priorities. Uh, alongside that is a need f in some areas to uh, bring in additional skills, to bring in new skills uh, and bring in a broader range of skills. And uh, where uh, the government has got to in that is by commencing that programme of work and progressing that programme of work. Uh, that will continue, and as we say in the report, it continues on a kind of project-by-project, uh, project, department by department basis. And as additional needs are identified, then a case for that will be considered and made within the government's overall plans for staffing. One of the key elements of that is related, of course, to the cost question. So as decisions are made, as uh, 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 clarity is reached over uh, how individual things will be implemented, a key element of that is what, who are the people that we need and how do we get them? And do we have that capacity at the moment for, as a government or do we need to add to that capacity? I think overall, in terms of the overall question, I think we're quite clear that of the scale of the task here, and one of the key questions for government is the extent to which that can be absorbed within uh, current resource levels uh, and the, the extent to which that needs to have additional resources deployed uh, within the civil service for, 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 for this activity. Uh, a key uh, part of that is the model that's adopted for social security and what the resourcing requirements around that are. And the government's made some commitments to uh, announce its plans in that area uh, in the spring this year. Uh, and and, and uh, there's a, st a statement planned, of course, in the House this afternoon, which may or may not uh, uh, give some, some clarity of that. So as those things are decided and as that's worked through, some of the answers to those questions will become clear. What we're clear about in the report is there's a need to do that and there's a need to have the high-level figures that emerge from that in a cost sense. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, on page 19, and it's in um, paragraph 42, it says, one of the biggest challenges facing the transition programme is the recruitment of enough staff with the right skills. Recruitment campaigns that ran from September to December 2016 did not fill all posts on a permanent basis, including the chief executive. Um, could you explain to me, if you have the detail of it, what the recruitment campaign was? Um, and if there's um, any reason um, that they weren't able to fill the posts that they had hoped they would. So I'll, I'll talk about this. Um, so this is a, a, a crucial element, of course, of establishing the new Scottish Fiscal Commission, which in itself is a, a, a very important component of the whole uh, new devolved finances that we have in Scotland. In terms of the, the staffing side of things, um, one of the challenges, I think, and, and, and picking up on Mark's point as well, is that there are new, there are there are skill sets that, uh, for example, the Fiscal Commission needs that are new to Scotland. You know, things like forecasting and, and the like. So, um, 
they proceeded with their uh, recruitment campaign. Um, I think they were uh, quite surprised by the, the positive response they got to that when we were speaking to the, the commissioners themselves and to office, officials at uh, the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, I think they set out on the basis that they knew they probably wouldn't get everything they needed the first time around, and therefore they had uh, pretty good contingency plans in place. So taking together what they were able to achieve through the recruitment exercise alongside drawing on uh, officials from Scottish Government um, were of the view that uh, as of this month, in fact, when they take up their new statutory role, that they have what they need to do to perform their function and we'll be able to uh, you know, build on that in terms of the transition to its own staff, if you like, in due course. But the, 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 our, our sense, based on the evidence that we had, is that they are pretty well placed to be able to deliver on their new activities. Um, I think there's more work needed in terms of bringing the leadership to the Scottish Fiscal Commission in terms of, in terms of um, establishing a permanent arrangement for Chief Executive. What they have just now is working well in terms of the transition arrangements and a new Deputy Chief Executive. So they've got that leadership. Uh, it's that balance between having proper leadership, which we believe they have at the moment, and allowing that new person to come in and to do what that new person wishes to do in terms of taking the Fiscal Commission forward. So in summary, I think in a good position just now and a bit more work to do to get it fully established into the way that the, uh, the commissioners would like to see the, the commission itself. Um, I mean, coming from a region in the North East where we really do struggle to recruit into the public sector anyway, in, a, in, a, in a variety of areas, um, it, the, the, it not being able to have a full staff complement, especially on something new like this, could really hold you back. I mean, how high is the risk, do you think, of not being able to recruit all the necessary posts? Um, I think the when we, as I say, when we were talking to the commissioners themselves, I think that uh, they were quite uh, pleased with the response that they'd got. Um, I think they were pleased from the point of view that uh, of the calibre of type of people in backgrounds. Um, I think there's a sense, and we see this in you know, other areas, for example, in Revenue Scotland, there's a feeling amongst people that they would like to be involved from the start in this new area of work. This is this is new stuff. It doesn't happen very often, obviously, and there's a real desire to be part of that. So I think that that confidence as well. But we certainly probe that as part of our audit work because it is such a vital part of the work of the Fiscal Commission. And in terms of the um, uh, where, what we were hearing from both officials and from the commissioners themselves, uh, th there was a confidence that they had what they needed to do to be able to deliver the important function that the, uh, that the statute expects of them. In, in the report, in that same paragraph, it mentions the interim chief executive and uh, an appointed interim deputy chief executive as well. Um, and I just know from my council experience, when you have someone who's interim or covering, there's usually an additional cost to that. And has there been any additional cost to have somebody filling in interim rather than permanent? So I don't have the detail of that to hand. Um, but it's part of the transition. Having having gone out and looked for a permanent chief executive, and we're not able to do that in terms of, you know, it's important. Um, that in these circumstances that you get the right person for the job. It's not a case of just filling a post. It has to be the right person that sets the right tone and provides the right leadership for the organisation. So I don't have the detail in terms of the costs itself, but the fact that they don't have a permanent chief executive in place at the moment suggests that there is budget capacity to be able to support the existing uh, leadership that they have in the Fiscal Commission. No, I appreciate that. I just I know um, from council when we have directors um, and we can't recruit. Uh, we've had ex in Aberdeen just for example, and then you have to usually pay over the odds for someone from an agency and uh, just in order that it's filled. So I wasn't sure if that was in the, this was sort of similar to this case. I think they've been able to find the right people that they need from uh, through through existing channels to carry them through the the arrangement that's there. The the, the chief executive uh, currently is. Um, you know, has, has come from a civil service background and, uh, you know, as, 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 as we see in here, they've, they've taken it to a good place to be ready to deliver what needs to do from April. OK, and the last, the last um, question, convener, which is page um, 16, and it's in um, paragraph 31, and it said, ensuring a smooth transition of powers from the UK Parliament to the Scottish Parliament requires officials in the bodies involved to build and maintain effective working relationships, which I agree with, but just out of interest, has there been any evidence to suggest that that hasn't been happening now that it's included in your report? I wasn't sure if you'd picked up on something that made you say that. No, I think we're, we're simply reporting on the arrangements that are in place and the, their importance going forward, given the, the 
interdependencies that are baked into the fiscal framework between the UK government and the Scottish government for making good use of the new financial powers. Um, I think our evidence is that those arrangements are developing well and that issues that have arisen have been resolved, um, including, for example, the initial block, on, block grant adjustments on the two devolved taxes. Um, if I had a comment to make, I think is that there's scope for more transparency about the working of the arrangements as we go forward, um, as we move into a world where Scotland has... Um, control or oversight of more than half of the, the funding that it spends to have more clarity about what meetings are planned of the joint ministerial committees and of what's been discussed and agreed at them I think would be a, a bonus for the Parliament and for Scotland more widely. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to you, Auditor General and staff. Uh, firstly, to, to thank you very much for, for the, the report that you've given us. It's very helpful, very thorough, and I think it's very positive and in a sense it, it provides us with a, a really useful framework for the scrutiny that's, that's, that's going to be required here. And my, my question relates to the scrutiny landscape and what it might look like going forward. As you've noted in the report, it transfers back to Scotland about £22 billion. It's, it's almost two thirds of the, the current Scottish budget. So uh, it's really important that we understand where the scrutiny will lie. Um, we do know, of course, that the Finance Committee and the Budget Review Group will be looking at the reporting elements here, and I'm delighted to say it will be part of that process too, convener. But I just wonder, Auditor General, if you could give us a, a flavour of where you see the scrutiny taking place and whether it would be this, this committee alone that would be looking at the bulk of this. Um, a note on page 13 from the, the, the chart that's there that there are intergovernmental relationships going on here, that is clearly the case. So where's the opportunity for yourself as an organisation to participate in that scrutiny process? And where is the opportunity for this committee to oversee and scrutinise what's going on uh, there? I think you're absolutely right to um, identify that this really is a, a very significant change in the Scottish Parliament's financial, public financial management responsibilities um, from a position very recently where the Parliament's role was really to agree how the budget should be spent to one which is much more about how much should be raised, how it should be raised and what the priorities are for investment for the future, both in capital terms and social investment. Um, I think that was very much the thinking between the establishment of the budget process review, review group that was set up between Parliament and the government. Um, I'm pleased to be a member of that and have a chance to play the views here into the deliberations. Um, I think one of the... Um, the key focus of the work so far within the group has been how to support parliamentary scrutiny in a way which is workable and practicable for government as well. Um, and I think we're seeing some um, thinking developing there that's included in the consultation report that was published back in March for how we can balance um, what will inevitably be a relatively constrained period for scrutiny of the budget with much wider scrutiny across the financial year of what we're achieving for that. Um, and uh, making sure that that's in the context of a, a longer-term financial strategy, as we're describing in this report. So I think that's all um, real progress, and the details will be worked through over the next couple of months, running up to the publication of that report and its discussion by Parliament for the future. I think one of the issues that we have a particular interest in, and that this committee does as well, um, is that sort of wavy line of devolution that Mr Beatty referred to earlier, um, that we are moving from a world where the devolution settlement in the um, original legislation was very clear. If something wasn't reserved, it was devolved. The Scottish Parliament had oversight of it, and I audited it and provided reports to this Parliament, to this committee, um, to be able to use in scrutiny, increasingly for large parts of the budget, for income tax, for VAT, for some of the social security powers. That responsibility will be shared with UK government departments, um, which are and will continue to be audited by the National Audit Office and my counterpart, the Comptroller and Auditor General. And I think it's fair to say we're still working through how those arrangements will work in practice. You might recall from your previous time on this committee that we've got a starting point in place in the arrangements that were agreed for auditing the Scottish rate of income tax. They are a starting point, but they're probably not going to be sufficient to cover the whole range of new responsibilities. And we then have other areas like the Crown Estate um, and some of the other uh, areas that are devolved under the 2016 Act, where we're really just at the starting point of thinking um, if there's still an, a relationship with the UK government and what that means for this committee. So work in progress, but I think an important issue for this committee to stay cited on as those arrangements are developed and indeed to influence. Yeah, I certainly remember, of course, the discussion about your involvement in the SRIT 
in the memorandum of understanding that's in place there. But did you just say there that that will apply, that, that kind of rule for yourselves will apply to all of the other, the air departure tax, the VAT component? Will you have a, a definite role in all of these to participate or even scrutinise what's going on between the two governments? Things that are fully devolved, I think they're very straightforward. So the, we know that the air departure tax will be um, administered by Revenue Scotland. I already um, audit Revenue Scotland and can report to you about the audit of that body, as well as through reports like this on the overall process. Um, for the areas that are a shared responsibility, um, then the arrangements um, will need to be developed to, to reflect that shared responsibility. Um, and what I, um, my, my view is that the uh, arrangements we have in place around the Scottish rate of income tax provide a useful starting point, but they're not the full story. They'll need further development. I can see that Gordon's looking to come in here, so I'll invite him to well, add. I'm just, I'm just going to agree and, and, and you know, more work to be done, I think, yeah. Okay. Uh, on page 24, uh, in that very useful exhibit 5, the, it's about SRIT, but it gives us a, a positive breakdown of the the costs going forward from the initial estimate of about 45 million down to about 30 million, and that's very welcome. But you do notice in that, colleagues, that the IT estimate has uh, doubled <laughs> from the estimate in 2010 till, till now. Is there any? I was looking for some further information in the report about that. Have you? Can you give us any information about what the reason for that may be? I, th I think I think the starting point is to recognise that since this report was prepared, the Scottish and UK governments have prepared a further annual report on their progress in implementing the new powers, and that includes some updated figures around what the expected uh, uh, costs are, 2017 figures essentially, and that indicates IT costs of between 13 and 17 million. So they're, they're estimating that those will drop down a wee little bit from the 20 million, but still above where they initially set off. I think the sense we've got is that. Uh, that at, through time there's been more of a focus of, of, on this project on uh, making the I, uh, developing IT systems so that they can accommodate the uh, variation in rates uh, that may or may not be decided by the Scottish Parliament and that's where the focus of the work has been and there's been need for less work on some of the, the staff side and some of the communication side and less uh, decisions to spend less in those areas. So it's really about the balance between uh, uh, the input through people and uh, people's time and advice uh, and uh, those sort of uh, things towards spending money on uh, getting the IT to work in a way that supports the uh, the, 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 the new powers. Okay, just last question, convener. Just, just in the kind of general scrutiny landscape again, Auditor General DC, yourself bringing to us a report on the VAT component one week perhaps and their departure due to the next. It's, it's just it's so that we can keep a focus on the initial stages of these transfer of powers and revenue raising and so on, so that we can <coughs> clearly see what we're dealing with in terms of the transfer of powers. It, it, it may be important, I think, to the, to the committee to focus solely on these for some period of time until they bed in perhaps, and then we can generally regard them as part of the whole pot that we would ultimately be wanted to scrutinise. So do you see a kind of separation initially so that the members in the committee and the parliament have got clear lines of sight on these particular powers? At, at the moment, my plan is to continue producing for this committee a report like this about every springtime, just giving you an update on progress with the overall implementation of the 2016 Act, plus, of course, the annual Section 22 report on the Scottish Government's accounts that will come to you in the autumn each year. So there'll be two bites at the cherry on the big picture. Um, beyond that, there may well be instances where I think it's appropriate to um, either bring you a report on progress on a specific aspect of the powers, or indeed um, to come to you with a question about the oversight that the committee and the parliament want for some of those tricky areas that you asked a couple of questions ago. Um, we know that the Scottish Government and the UK Government have started to think about the accountability and audit arrangements for some of that. Um, that thinking is at an early stage, but as it develops, I think it's important the Parliament should have a chance to express its own views on what it needs and expects in order to be able to provide that oversight and scrutiny of what will be very significant powers and amounts of money in future. Okay. Very helpful. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, one of the recommendations in your report is um, that the Scottish Government should demonstrate publicly the progress it is making towards introducing a comprehensive account of Scotland's public finances and you've very helpfully and I think positively set out some of the steps that have been taken already so 
I think it's, it's pleasing that there's some, some good progress there. Um, I suppose section um, 112 in the report onwards covers this. Um, you have said that the Scottish Government does need to be clearer um, what spending is aiming to achieve and how this contributes to the Scottish Government's overall purpose and specific outputs and outcomes. Um, when you said that, in, in what way does the government need to be clearer? Could you expand on that? Um, and I, I should preface it by saying that's an important part of the work of the Budget Process Review Group, is to look at how um, the information that Parliament gets can tie the budget proposals more closely to what they're intended to achieve. <laughs> Um, the starting point is that for any public organisation, the purpose of raising taxes and spending money isn't as for a private company to, to make a profit. It's to provide services to people, and the purpose of those services is to improve the quality of life for the people who work and live here. Um, and the, the Scottish Government, I think, was ahead of the pack in agreeing the National Performance Framework 10 years ago and setting those very clear outcomes. What we haven't seen since then is a, a systematic development of plans for reporting. Um, if, for example, there's a, an expected increase in spending on education or on health and social care, what are the outcomes that um, the government expects to see from that? And how will it report progress towards that, given that outcomes often take years or a generation to, to have an effect. Now, none of us on the Budget Process Review Group are saying that's an easy thing to do, but it does feel it's a very important thing to do in the context of the National Performance Framework, and particularly as we move into a world where the government can raise taxes, um, can make other changes or investments with the intention of improving the relative performance of the Scottish economy, and use that to really drive outcomes in a much more comprehensive and systematic way than it's been able to in the past. Um, so it's about making that link between the way in which money is being raised and spent and what it's intended to achieve. OK, thank you. I see that the Scottish Government also intends to publish a Tailored for Scotland 2016-17 consolidated accounts and the report says that this was under consideration and the commitment was taken by April now. I know your report covered up to February. Are you able to give us an update on what progress has been made in that area? The, the update from the Scottish Government gives the most up-to-date commentary on where it feels it's reached to around that. I think we're comfortable that there's a real commitment to introduce accounts of that nature. I think we recognise that there's plans in place, but the job's not yet done yet. And I think uh, it's very helpful to read in the Scottish Government's response that despite some issues around uh, some of the standards around uh, how roads are measured in accounts, that the government is continuing with those plans and looks to try and implement that. I think that was there was a question mark whether that might uh, cause a real difficulty in the government's plans, but I think we're really pleased uh, at the commitment that they've given to continue to work towards that. These things are very important because increasingly given all the powers that the Auditor General uh, has talked about and we've, uh, we've been discussing, uh, the whole picture in Scotland matters. Some, uh, what, what, what's the extent of financial risk? What's the extent of the opportunities to use the finances of, of the public finances right across Scotland? And what uh, consolidated public accounts would give one important element of that big picture. It doesn't do the whole job. It's alongside other accounting and other reports, but we think it's a really important element and we really value the commitments the government has made to move towards that. I think the government was suggesting um, a number of trial runs in, involving other groups and in, in public bodies. Are you able to see any more on that and how important that approach is? Is that is that a useful way to do it? A key part of this is to get the buy-in. Because this looks to try and bring together information from right across the public sector, a key part of that is to explain what this is for and, and, and how that process will work and look to get the buy-in of other bodies to do that. And I think looking to try and pilot that is, is a good way forward. I think there's something about uh, how long that takes and uh, that the, the, the momentum's maintained to deliver uh, the reporting, the range of financial reporting that's needed now that these new powers are in place. Mm. So do we know if these um, trials are underway or what the timeline is for that? So I think, uh, again, uh, the, the discussion is about whether it's a, 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 it would be possible to do that for the 2016-17 accounts. And uh, the government's indicated in its response it would look to, look to explore that. That's not quite the same as saying it's going to happen, and we would hope that it would happen. OK, so that would be to be encouraged. Um, I mean, it is really important, um, and your report recognises that, that the public have enough financial information. And, and Willie Coffey talked about scrutiny, um, which is what we're all here to do. But 
you know, it, it's clear um, from the short time that I've been here in Parliament that this comes up a lot, that people don't think that, that you know, parliamentary scrutiny is robust enough. So I wondered if you could maybe just touch on what you think some of those barriers to scrutiny are mm -hmm. and what the scope here is to, to really change, you know, the, the, uh, the approach to scrutiny and also to get better information into the system too. I'll kick off. Mark may want to come in. Um, and it's a, it's a question, as you can imagine, that's got loads in it. We've been thinking about this for the last three or four years, as, as it's been clear how the financial powers are changing. In terms of the, the Parliament itself, um, I think there are some straightforward things that you've just been discussing to have a fully consolidated set of accounts for the Scottish public sector, as we have for the UK government as a whole, which includes everything that the government owns and owes, what it raises and what it spends in one place. So you can see that big picture. At the moment, most of the information is available, but you have to work quite hard to pull it together and to make sense of it, and it should be much easier for you. Um, alongside that, we've talked about linking um, what money is being spent on and what it's achieving. I think that's a very important picture. Um, and then in this new world, the longer term view, not just of this year, but what's happening over a period of time, looking back and looking forward, and, and that will also make a difference. Um, all of that is complex and complicated, but it, 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 it is doable. The Budget Process Review Group has seen some great examples from governments around the world, large and small, um, that are able to do that. And there, there's room for making some um, very significant improvements, some of them quite short term, some of them slightly longer term to put in place. Um, in terms of the engagement of people and communities, that's a really important um, strand of that that I think hasn't had as much attention so far. Um, and the Budget Process Review Group has been looking at things like um, the Open Government Partnership, to which the Scottish Government has signed up, and some of the other third sector initiatives that are around that are, that are proposing things like citizens' budgets that are designed to be um, simple to understand, to enable people to drill down using IT to, to find out more they if they want to, but to get that big picture um, and to think about building on the principles that are already in this government's programme for government around community empowerment, around participatory budgeting and thinking about how some of those things that are designed currently to work at a local level could work at the Scottish level as well. I suspect some of that will take longer, but you're absolutely right to keep it at the forefront of the thinking about where we need to be going. Thank you. And just lastly, you know, I think... You know, it is clear the Scottish Government is, is, is making a commitment to enhance financial transparency. Um, I'm just thinking about other um, recent sessions we've had at this committee where people say they are committed to being open and transparent and um, it doesn't always materialise that way. So delivery is absolutely key here. Um, you know, Ross Thompson's touched on workforce planning and recruitment issues. Um, you know, Willie Coffey's talked about uh, so IT systems and costs there. Um, how confident um, are you that there will be the right people and the right skills, the right systems, and really the right approach in place to make sure that, that we really do get very clear financial reporting and, and do in, in, increase... Um, transparency and, and help all of us scrutinise um, government spending? I hope it's clear from my report that we think reasonable progress is being made in the context of a very significant and challenging programme of work um, and that there are some real challenges that need to be addressed. Um, I suspect they're probably questions that are be better addressed to the Scottish Government if you decide to take, take it forward in that way to get under the skin of their confidence and the commitments that they, are, they want to make to you for the um, months that are coming up as we head into these new powers for real. Thank you. Alex Neil. Just one short question. <coughs> We've seen how HMRC underestimated the number of Scottish taxpayers by about 400,000, which is now being rectified. But it begs the question around some of the reliability of some of the figures, and I specifically want to ask about VAT, because VAT assigned revenues is now going to be such a large proportion uh, of the funding for the Scottish Government. Um, and... <coughs> My basic question is, how robust is the calculation of what monies should be assigned from VAT based on the first 10p of the 20p rate and the first 2.5p of the 5p rate? Uh, is there a danger that we uh, are seeing a, an underestimate of that money uh, from the UK government, which wouldn't surprise me? Um, you're absolutely right that that's one of the key questions that needs to be resolved going forward. Um, as with uh, Scottish income tax initially, this, the 
the information that would be needed to assign VAT on a very accurate basis simply hasn't been needed in the past, and both governments have agreed that the overhead of collecting that information would outweigh the likely benefits of it, and therefore the um, basis for allocation will be an estimate rather than hard data, um, and the mechanism by which that estimate will be arrived at is still being negotiated. Mark, do you want to say a bit about progress on that? Yeah, just to add to that, so that, that, that the preparations for that are at a very early stage. Uh, our understanding, and this is reinforced from the recent progress reporting by both governments, is that a team has been put together and is looking at that, and an initial uh, methodology will be worked up uh, later this year, and that will be a basis for uh, developing that and having a more firm uh, basis for going forward. Obviously, a key ingredient of the system, and there's obviously a clear timetable for that to be done. I think the one thing that we do know is that that will be on a consumption basis. It's where money's spent rather than where businesses operate, and there's been a decision in the fiscal framework around that. But beyond that, it's about the governments working together to work up that methodology and, 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 and as you suggest, that that estimate is as firmly based and as well understood as possible. The only thing I'd add to that, Mr Neil, is that that seems to me like a very good example of the sort of area where this committee and the Scottish Parliament will want good audit assurance about the processes that are in place, and we don't yet know how that will work. My immediate supplementary to Mark's contribution was to say, will we have a chance to comment on the methodology before it's adopted by both governments? I think we should have. I think it certainly would be very useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very good example is if I'm a, U a, a Scottish company operating in Scotland and I am exporting a significant share of my production but my exports go via Hull or Dover for example then very clearly that could have a major impact on the estimate of how much VAT I actually pay uh, because obviously you don't pay VAT on exports but would that be counted as exports, for example. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not expecting you to answer the question, but I mean, it is a highly complicated uh, set of calculations, but uh, if we get it wrong, then um, we could be severely shortchanged. You're absolutely right that that's an element of the fiscal framework which um, has still to be agreed and which has potentially got significant implications for the Scottish budget. I know when the fiscal framework itself was being agreed last spring, um, the Finance Committee um, held a number of evidence sessions on progress and on the content of it. Um, I assume the Parliament will want to do the same as these additional elements are being uh, developed and taken forward. The way in which the Parliament does that, I think, is a matter for the Parliament itself to decide. But the interest is a real and genuine one. I mean, I think, convener, obviously the Finance Committee would presumably be the lead committee, but I think there is an audit element to this to make sure the methodology is robust. And yep. I think that's our remit. Yes, I agree, and I think if the clerks could make sure we don't overlap with the Finance yes. Committee but express an interest in, in that area, I think that would be helpful to put an early marker down. Anything else, Mr Neil? No, that's, that's all, thanks. Liam Kerr? Thank you, Convener. Uh, I, just, uh, I think Mr Neil makes important points about the reliability of the figures and, and talks about the risk of underestimating. Uh, I'm just concerned about the risk of overestimating. Uh, I, I see at page 9 there's a summary, a timeline for new financial powers with various figures in. Uh, and there are just two particularly that I wish to focus on because the, the first one talks about the land and buildings transaction tax and forecasts a revenue for... 1718 at 507 million. Uh, now, we've obviously seen this week that there's been a study which would question the uh, accuracy with which LBTT receipts have been uh, gauged. Uh, and I just wonder how robust can we assume this figure to be at 507 million given what we've learned this week? I think there are two elements to that. Um, the first is that. Um, one of the messages we would like to leave with the committee is that within the Scottish budget there will inevitably be more uncertainty and more volatility than there ever has been before. However good the forecasting is, forecasts aren't the same as reality and there will be a difference between the forecasts at the budget um, cycle stage and even more in the medium term financial strategy that will change over time. 
Um, the second is that we are at quite an early stage in doing this for all of the new taxes, and the taxes themselves are either brand new taxes or are different in subtle ways from what went before. Um, and it's, be, it's to be expected that there will be a difference between um, the forecast and the outcomes that's greater than in normal times, if there's such a thing anymore, I think that's a point for discussion, um, than just simply because they are so new and people are working out how to do it. Um, Gordon, do you want to add more on the specifics of that particular tax? Yeah, I, th I think um, I think one of the key, the key elements to, to 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 touch back in the earlier conversation is just the role of the Scottish Fiscal Commission in this, and that should provide a bit more assurance round about the uh, when budgets have been brought forward as of this year, um, as of April this year, the, the the Commission's got statutory responsibilities, including preparing forecasts for things like the devolved taxes. So I think that will provide a, an independent view on what the forecast should be alongside whatever the government's forecasts are. So that, that's a new part of the, the process that should help, um, as I say, give a bit more assurance in that area and, and that type of thing. But I don't think there's anything more to add other than that, just to replay that thing that we say a number of times in the report. This, this, is, a, this is a whole new setup with a whole new opportunities and risks uh, that, that are attached to that. And, and just following on from that, we, I see you've projected for or the Scottish Government is projected for air departure tax. Do you know what assumption underlies that 326 million figure for 2018-19? Insofar as, do you understand that forecast to be based on a straight flip from what is currently happening as air passenger duty uh, over, so 100% uh, flip to, to air departure tax? Or does this assume that the 50% cut that the Scottish Government's proposing has been put in play? So, so mm. straightforward to answer that is it's a former of those two. That, that figure is taken from the GERS figures, which was an estimate uh, prepared by the Scottish Government as part of the GERS package uh, to uh, estimate what the current policy would, would contribute once those monies were devolved to Scotland. The separate process then is what decisions are made around the shape of the tax and, and, and the forecast that will flow from that will follow for, uh, and once those decisions are made. understand. Thank you. Okay. Um, Auditor General, thank you very much for your evidence today. Thank you, Mr Taylor and Mr Smale as well. Um, we now move into private session. <laughs>